name is Jerry. I can't remember his last name. Jared Bailey. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Lightweight's Podcast. My name's Joe. Today we have Jared Bailey of Dropouts Podcast. For a while, she was like, you don't even have to pay me. Like, I, I just like being here for fun. And then it's like. Done. What? <laughs> Dropouts has been blowing up lately. They got new co-hosts, Tari Yummy, Zach Justice, Jared. The dream team is all together. Who wrote the Tari Yummy theme song? Oh, that was all AI. Jared opens the curtain, lets us see just how Dropouts really works. There's that that classic kind of marketing technique or um, lesson that people teach where you need seven touch points on average to convert a customer. So if you're new, make sure to hit the subscribe button. Let me know who else you want to see on the podcast. And we're almost at 30,000 subscribers. Pretty freaking sick. Thank you guys so much for supporting this podcast. You're awesome. We get into like arguments and disagreements sometimes because Zach is very much like. Him. Please enjoy Jared Bailey. Are you the tech guy on Dropouts? You know all the gizmos oh, yeah. and stuff behind it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the name Dropouts for me is a facade because I graduated from college in two years. Um, I always like to say that I dropped out of my parents' expectations because, um, you know, they one of them worked for Procter & Gamble for 35 years. The other one uh, worked for Kellogg's, you know, so they both had normal jobs. And then I was like, I want to make movies and music. Did your mom who worked at Kellogg's bring home? Oh, all the time. Shut up. Yeah, she worked in the factory that did like all the Keebler elf uh, like cookies and stuff. That's my dream. Dude, it was the best. It was the best. She would always my favorite. Favorites were um, she would obviously bring home like the fudge stripe cookies, but uh, the best were like the chocolate fudge like sticks. You put those in the freezer. Oh my god! She worked straight at the the source. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did she was she a factory worker or what? She do no. She did like the back end. She was kind of like uh, the manager for like the maintenance and cleaning and stuff like that. But got all of the benefits of bringing home the cookies and stuff. Did was, you ever go to the factory? No, I never did. I we'd drive by it a lot, but I was never able to go inside. And that's in California. No, no, no. That's Ohio. Uh, that was technically in Kentucky. But it was when I was living in Ohio. Did she smell like cookies when she came home every day? No, because she. Uh, I wish she, she wasn't really like on the factory floor. She was always like in the offices, you know, in the back end. But it was, oh God, it was the best, though. It, it really was. That would be my dream. Maybe they're the Doritos factory. Oh, my God. Anything like from the Frito-Lay company, I yeah. would die for. So good. And then even Procter & Gamble, my mom would come home. I had Old Spice all my life. Like, I don't think we ever had to buy deodorant, shampoo, because they got head and shoulders, you know. It was it was everything. Wow. Yeah. You were the dream kid. I was the dream kid. And you know what we gave out on Halloween? Deodorant. We gave out, well, deodorant, and then back when P&G still owned Pringles, we were that house that gave out Pringles and then, like, Keebler Elf the products. The most popular house in the neighborhood. You know it. Jared Bailey of Dropouts Podcast. Thanks you for guys, having me. You guys have blown up in the past few months. It's insane. It's all Tara. I'm going to be so honest. It's all Tara, but we love her, and, you know, it's been such a blast and a ride. When Tara first joined Dropouts, was she really a replacement guest? She was, she was like, we wanted her on, but also it was like kind of a last minute, like planning thing. I think Zach handles most of like the guest reach out. Um, but yeah, I think it was like a little bit of a last minute thing. And then when she came on, we just clicked instantly. Did you guys keep doing episodes with her right away? No, we took, uh, a little bit of a break because after her I think we did like uh, Jake and Johnny and then a few other guests and then we had her back on around Thanksgiving or Christmas time when Zach did uh, the Grinch makeup because we know that she hates the Grinch and so uh, in between that time is when we were like building our friendship and then felt more comfortable to be like hey would you want to do this all the time every week for the rest of your life <laughs> How'd that conversation go? Was she interested right away? Oh, yeah. She loved it. You know, like she um, she asked uh, or when we asked her to come on for like the Grinch episode, she was like, yeah, absolutely. And it was just like at that time, like the friendship was had a pretty good foundation. And then uh, she just like for a while, she was like, you don't even have to pay me. Like, I, I just like being here for fun. And You're it's like, like done well, <laughs> for a, a second. We were like sweet deal <laughs> and then we're like that's kind of scummy if we don't pay her <laughs> who wrote the tari yummy theme song oh that was all ai which is 
so terrifying. Oh, I thought Zach actually wrote it. No, no, so he's using. I think it's called Sona AI. Um, I get ads for them all the time. Do you? Yeah. Do you want to hear your favorite artist sing a song for you? And it's that's basically yeah. So it's like a super simple like uh, interface where you just say like write a song about a girl named Tara Yummy that uh, you know doesn't know where she's gonna wake up in the morning and you know blah 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 and then make it sound like a pop punk band and then it spits out the vocals the instrumental it does all the writing for you it's it's nuts what's crazy is this is the beginning phase of that technology and that's how good it sounds that's what zach and i were talking about like i think sona when he was doing it and showing me um it was uh, like on their website, it says like V3. I was like, this is only the third version of it. Like imagine it from a year from now, you know, it's it, like as a musician, I was, you know, I was like, oh, there's so much humanity in like music that it's like, you can't take that away. And then it spits out that. And I'm just like, it's not perfect, but it's passable to like the everyday listener. It's you a know? solid demo. Yeah. It's a solid demo. It's so terrifying. Who sang the song? That was all AI too? That was all AI. So they, they must have like voice models and whatnot, like kind of dipping into that, uh, that it's like trained, you know, to spit out certain genres and whatnot. But, and it, it's crazy on top of that, it gives you uh, a, like a male voice and a female voice. So you can hear either or? Yeah wild yeah what'd you think of the jared bailey song listen beautiful both of them amazing <laughs> 10 out of 10 songs Top notch. the subject matter a little <laughs> yeah. questionable what were you doing in that song huh <laughs> um zach zach was calling in to question my sexuality which honestly is not a new thing um i've been dealing with that all my life especially with having two moms you know and like one of my best friends her dad still thinks that i'm gay which is kind of fun it's always like a little joking thing whenever like i hang out at their house he's like so are you and i was like no one i'm i'm not and he's not like one of these days <laughs> maybe we'll find out <laughs> Do you and Zach ever get into real fights? Not like fight fights. We get into like arguments and disagreements sometimes because, uh, you know, Zach is very much like his way or the highway. And uh, sometimes if you try to challenge that, uh, you'll get into like a little bit of a tiff. But, you know, for the most part, his his way is usually pretty good and then if you know we do so come to some sort of compromise we just talk it out you know because i saw a clip of the two of you both going after one girl and <laughs> as zach left town you pursued that girl Which, no, he's got that story all wrong and it blew up on tiktok and yes it was my clip and yes it was on my <laughs> podcast and yes i stirred the pot a lot but that was crazy and i thought the podcast was ending <laughs> So is it? No, no. He's got that. He loves to blow that story out of proportion. Okay. It Did was you see simple, that clip? Yeah, of course I saw that clip. I got that clip sent to me so many times. And people were taking it so seriously. They're like, dude, I can't believe you're such an asshole. I can't believe you would do this to <laughs> your best friend. It was the background friend. music. Yeah, I, I know. It was just like, which granted, hilarious clip. So perfect for like clickbait, rage bait, you know, all of that. But like the the story is that we met these two girls in line waiting for like a friend show, and uh, we became friends with both of them. This is and the real story. This is the real story. Okay. Okay. He was talking to the one girl that he says I tried to steal, and I was still friends with her, and they were like we weren't talking they were talking on the phone every night they were texting all the time you know it was like and this is when he and i were still sharing a room like i legitimately had to wingman him and like put on noise canceling headphones and face the other way while he was on facetime with her you know like he was in there much more than i was and i wasn't even trying to be in there with her you know and uh and then but she was just like hey like let's hang out uh sometime and i was like at, I was working on like film and TV at the time. I was actually working on American Horror Story 1984. Making music for it? No, no, no. I, I used to be like a PA uh, on That's sets cool. and stuff. Yeah. And so I was like, uh, we were doing night shoots and I was like, hey, 
I have to be on set at six. Um, do you want to like go get uh acai bowls at like four this or something. This is the date that you stole her from This is him. This is the date that I tried to steal her from. Sneaky and like, little devil. I didn't think I had to tell Zach about me going and getting acai bowls with a friend but before But a real work. friend would have told him. He also wasn't around, you know? He was doing fuck all whatever he was doing at the time, you know? So I wasn't trying to steal her. He just loves to make me look like a bad person. <laughs> maybe, Maybe you make yourself look like it. Maybe, maybe, or I think he's trying to compensate for something. Maybe we'll find out. Maybe we'll find <laughs> out. But when did you do PA work? Always? Uh, when I first moved out here. So I grew up and went to school in Cincinnati. And then my senior year, at least like the year that I graduated. Of high um, school or college? College. Okay. Uh, the, the semester that I graduated, my division head came to me and he was like, hey, there's uh, an alumni that's doing, uh, that's directing an HBO docu-series and he wants to hire like an assistant on that and he wants to pull from like the program that he graduated from. Do you want to do it? And I said, yeah. So I interviewed, I applied, you know, and I ended up getting the job and then that's what brought me out here. So I worked, it was, uh, the series was called McMillions and I worked on that for about eight months. Uh, most of it was post-production cause they had already done like a lot of interviews. Uh, and so they were editing those down and then what was your day-to-day -day task on those? I mean, that essentially was, it was a lot of like, I was a, a gopher, you know, like go for this, go for that. So I would like get people's lunch, take care of the office. Um, eventually uh, he would let me cut down like certain scenes and, you know, edit those like certain interviews. What program? Uh, that was Avid. Oh, did you know it already or did you have to pick I it knew, up? I knew it a little bit because uh, we had learned some of it in school. So I knew enough of like the basics where I wasn't completely helpless. But for the most part, I always worked in Premiere. And so I was like, guys, this would be so much simpler in Adobe. You know? I had an entire class on Avid. Did Never you? use it since then. That's the thing. Like the only people that really use it are like old heads that have been in the industry for like 20 years. Like you know? newsroom people yeah. from forever ago. It's just, it's so not user friendly, you know? And then just like Adobe or even like Final Cut, like all these other programs, much more easy to use and uh, just more much more accept, uh, accessible, yeah. you know? And so, yeah, I, I did that. And then... The That's last... a water for you, by the way. If you want oh, to... thank you. Um, the last like two months of that job were uh, we went into production to do like cinematic recreations for the show and that's when i got my first real taste of like what actual production work was like and i loved it and so i wanted to go do that so uh, after eight months i finally left and then started doing like freelance production work with mcmillions what was that actual work the recreations of stuff that yeah so like they're telling the story of uh you know the the head of security that stole like all the monopoly mcdonald's you know prizes yeah one of the biggest scandals of all time it's insane the, it, that was my entire childhood like i felt like i was robbed you know can you explain what the mcmillions documentary is real quick yeah uh so there is his name's jerry i can't remember his last name jared bailey <laughs> <laughs> but he Zach was right <laughs> <laughs> that's me i'm a millionaire um but he he was the head of security for like the big pieces, like the boardwalk pieces, like the big prizes, you know, and he was in charge of distributing those to certain locations for real people to win. But instead he would just swap them out for, you know, cause it was in like envelopes, like sealed envelopes, whatever. And he would instead swap them out for, uh, like, regular prizes you know regular tickets and then he would sell these other ones to like friends and family oh he uh, sold the winning tickets to people yeah, yeah yeah so like he would sell like i think boardwalk was like a million or half a million or something and he would sell that for like under the price you know but just to get some cash in his pocket and then like help a friend but even like the family members that he would sell it to it was like family members with different last names so it never like 
he thought it could never be traced to him. And then he ended up selling to somebody who was kind of like mob tied a little bit, really seedy character. And uh, the FBI was like already cracking down on him. Then he won. And then they were like, well, there's no way this guy won legitimately. And then they were able to trace it back to him. And it was this whole bust. But the craziest part about it is that uh, it went to court. So it was going to be the nightmare of all PR stories for McDonald's. You know, that this whole game, their biggest game ever was rigged the entire time. And it went to court on 9-11. And so it completely got swept under the rug by the terrorist attack. And basically nobody had really ever heard of it until, and then like the, the directors heard of it, bought the rights to the story and then made the documentary. Who did they buy it. the rights from of the story to, from? I'm not a hundred percent sure who they bought it from. Um, but Is that guy still in jail? I think so. Or maybe I think he's still in jail, but I also think he's like really sick. So I think he's not going to last too long in jail. Oh. Um, but yeah, insane story. It was, it was so cool. And so like I've, I got to, part of the job they would take me to certain places so i got to go to chicago to mcdonald's headquarters and interview some people there uh, i got to go to atlanta and interview some of the actual fbi agents that worked on the case you know it was it was a really cool experience when you're doing that what kind of salary are you getting as a starting oh gopher? god so <laughs> this is this is where it got kind of like this is why I kind of had to leave too was because I was earning $500 a week. Um, but I was working like 60 to 80 hours cause the expectation was first one in the office, last one to leave. And you know, the editors or my bosses, they would come in super early and then everybody would leave super late, but they're all getting paid hourly, you know? And so I'm getting paid weekly and I was like, Oh, this sucks. And I was just like, I am not making enough money to survive out here. And so that's also one of the reasons why I wanted to leave, but it was technically classified under an internship, which in California, you have to pay interns, but there's no, beyond that, there's not a lot of like standards of which, you know, how much you have to pay them. It's like minimum wage, but you know, people kind of work around that, you know, so that's why it was like $500 a week. And at that time you were sharing a room with Zach? At that time we were living in a two bedroom apartment with 10 guys. You, and how much was your rent? My rent was 600 there. You know, that's pretty expensive considering yeah, you had 50 square feet that, <laughs> and sleeping in a bunk bed and one working bathroom. Yeah, it was it was a nightmare. But, uh, you know, and it's like, granted, rent could be like covered in a week of working, but also it's, uh, you know, you have other payments, you have like food, gas, gro you know, like car payments, all that stuff. So, uh yeah, it was it was not a lot of money. So for McMillions, you start doing PA work. Where do you go to apply for jobs like that? I got super lucky in the sense that the first AD um, on the recreations, uh, her name's Charity, and she and I just like clicked. Like she, we always joke that she was like my set mom, you know. And uh, so when I left and I told her, I was like, "Hey, I want to start doing freelance work." She hooked me up immediately she was like i'll hire you on any job that i'm working so i had an in there and then i got super close to the other pas um on the set and then they would hire me or they would like put my name in for you know other jobs that they were working and so uh yeah i luckily made a lot of good connections on that job and then worked pretty steadily after that up until covid and then from there you were able to move out of that room and get a yeah so six of us banded together and <laughs> um and basically just like falsified all these documents saying that we could afford this like three bedroom apartment and there was only three of us on the lease uh but six of us lived there and so we went from at that point, it was six in a room in one of the rooms, the room that I was in to now it was just me and Zach in a room. And then everybody else only had two people in their rooms, which is 
it, it felt like we were kings at that point, you know. Is that the same room, same apartment that you guys had the podcast with? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where so, that living room set up? Yeah, uh, we lived there. It probably wasn't until like maybe a year after we moved into that place that we started dropouts. But when we started it, uh, I think I think there were six people, maybe five. Because uh, once COVID hit, COVID was kind of the start of everybody else moving out. You know, uh, we had one guy, um, love him to death, uh, but he's, you know, his family is from like small town in Wisconsin. And so they kind of have that small town mentality. So when the pandemic hit, they're like, you need to come home. And he was also a model um, and he wasn't getting a lot of work out here. But his management was like, you keep getting jobs in Chicago. So he's uh you might as well move back to the Midwest and then, you know, live in Chicago and work there. And so now he's thriving out there, which is awesome. But he left first. And then um, another one of our roommates, I don't know what was going on with him, but something switched where it just wasn't a good environment to like live together with. So, so we ended up asking him to move out. And then, uh, so then it was down to four people. And at this time, this is all when the podcast was like still shot in our living room. And, uh, and you know, we'd have to like rearrange the furniture every time, set up the camera, set up the lights. Like it was annoying as hell. Um, so then there was four and then another guy ended up going back to, uh, Florida, um, to go home for with his family and then the the last guy uh ended up moving in with his girlfriend in like marina del rey they had been dating for like a year and a half at that point and so then it was just zach and i but it happened so slowly over time as the podcast grew that eventually uh by the time it was just me and zach the podcast could pay for our rent and it was it was just the most perfect like kind of subtle fade out you know what was the expectations when you guys first started dropouts I don't think we had any expectations, you know, I think it was just, we were bored in, you know, locked in the house and, uh, and we obviously like Zach and I both grew up watching podcasts, being fans of podcasts. And so we saw like what the potential was and, you know, obviously you want that, but we weren't expecting that. You know, it, I think it, it makes you kind of foolish to expect that uh, we knew it was going to be a lot of work and we knew it was going to take a lot of time. Um, but for the time being, it was just fun to do, you know, and it, it gave us a new outlet rather than just doing like the the 15 second to a minute social media clips. You know, it the only expectation we had was it would give us some form of longevity uh, for people to really get to know our characters. And now you guys are on the charts and you're one of the most successful ones. It's yeah. Wild. And it's funny. So, um, my boss on McMillions, uh, his name's Brian. If you ever watch Tom Segura's stand up, Tom Segura is his cousin. Um, and so he, he has some funny stories about his cousin, Brian on his stand ups. but it's crazy <laughs> to be, uh, on the charts, like with, Tom, you know, and like even, you know, like at some points above them. And it's like, I remember, like, I remember being introduced to you uh, through Brian. Um, And then now it's like, now we're not podcast equals because they've been doing it for like over a decade. And like your mom's house uh, and their whole studio company is thriving and they have so many podcasts but for me that's kind of my north star because i got introduced to him very early on and when we started the podcast i was like i want to be like your mom's house studios you know and now we're like starting to starting to get to that level have you guys started working on anyone else's podcasts not yet we're in talks with a few creators um to get it set up we just got a warehouse uh in north hollywood that we're going to start building out um different podcast uh sets in there and then just kind of have like this is the the foundation like the ground floor for uh this like media company the studio that we're trying to build and so we're going to start it's like a 3400 square foot warehouse that we're going to start building individual podcast sets for for different creators have you said any of the creators that you are working with 
Uh, I think so. I Well, Nikki Nia Chu is one of them that we're in talks with. Um, I think that's one that we've been decently public about, but nothing's set in stone yet, but we're both very interested, you know, um, in starting it together. So that's probably going to be the, the first one outside of our little family. You Would know? you move Dropouts podcast to that building? <sighs> you know, I've gotten asked this uh, internally and externally, and it's like it's a cool idea, but it is such a pain in the ass <laughs> to move that set. Like having to do it once from the apartment to the place that we're in now. It was like it was such a hassle and uh, I really don't want to do that again. Um, but and it's so convenient to just have it in your house. Like if we need to record ads or if we need to film like a last minute episode, you know, it's like we can just go downstairs and turn on the cameras and it's all there. So it's a cool idea. But I think for now, I'd love to just not deal with the hassle and keep it in the house. Did you think the Tara Yummy Zach Justice partnership would have worked i you know i like in theory i didn't because they seem like two completely different people <laughs> but in the friendship sense like opposites attract you know and uh zach plays so well with you know her just yappiness that uh it, and she she knows how to roll so well with like the jokes and the bits and stuff for the most part some some bits I'll, i'm on tara's side i'm like all right let's let's zach let's calm down okay <laughs> but yeah it's like it, when you if you just purely look at like their aesthetics or their content or whatever you're like how would these two ever how would these worlds combine and then when you see it on the podcast you're like I don't know how it's, it's kind of like weird food combinations, you know, it's like, I don't know why this tastes good, but I love it. That's and, such an interesting take. Yeah. How does the live show work with the two of them? Uh, very similar to like the podcast, you know, and that's kind of, we want to create like a unique experience, um, for the people that come to the live shows. Like we've got a lot of really cool ideas for the, the East coast shows that we're going to do, but, uh, yeah, for the most part, we also want the people to like experience what it's like to be in the podcast live. Uh, so, you know, there's, there is a, like a good section of us just talking, but also that's our one chance to like really interact with the, the people that listen to the podcast. And so we do a ton of crowd work as well. And, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's a blast for content strategy. You guys crush it on the clips, the shorts, posting so much. Mm -hmm. Do you think that played a huge factor into the blow up of it? I definitely think so. Because, you know, there's that that classic kind of marketing technique or um, like lesson that people teach where it's like you need seven touch points on average to convert a customer. Can you explain what that is? So you need, so the, the seven touch points are like, a person has to be exposed. I'm going to use it in terms of like a product, you know, or a service. A person has to be exposed to your product seven times on average before they commit to buying it, right? So whether they see it in a TV commercial, on a billboard, uh, in a newspaper flyer, or something like that, right? There are these different touch points where people see your product and then they'll convert. Um, and so we kind of took that lesson and applied it to the podcast where it's like, if we just pump out clips, you know, the more people see it, eventually they'll be like, okay, well, I've seen a hundred clips of these guys. I might as well check out the podcast, you know, and see what all the hype is about, especially if some of these clips go like viral or whatever they get so many views or so many likes they're like well people seem to really like this let me check out what this is what this is all about and uh so we adopted that strategy and we're working with a company called media scaling that uh does a lot of our our clips they do something like 1500 clips a month yeah and so it is just like it, it's kind of like overloading the system and i know it's working a because they keep like a very detailed tracker of like how many views how many likes how many followers like the growth of it all 
And since we started, I think last August or October, we're about to cross a, um, like a billion views uh, across like all of our shorts or like a short form content. And, you know, so if you think about it, it's like you need seven touch points, like how many people have out of that 1 billion views has, has that converted, you know? And, uh, and now it's like anywhere we go, uh, the first pr thing that people say is like, I see your clips everywhere. And so that's how I know it's working, you know? And, you know, some people stick to just the clips. Some people then convert or whatever, but either way people are being exposed to it. And so that's definitely like helped the, the, explosion of the podcast recently so is the central nucleus of your guys entire company the podcast and then you pull out the live show yeah. the patreon the clips the shorts yeah yeah so it's like it it's all centered around the main podcast and then the 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 patreon is to like give you know additional content for like the diehard fans uh and, you know, it's like it's kind of like a, a thank you for supporting us. And then also it like helps us grow the show because we are just constantly reinvesting the money that we make into the show, which is why we're able to like start the media company and then, uh, you know, grow podcasts from that or be able to like travel to these live shows, you know, because at this point we don't we're not like taking money from the podcast yet, you know? And so like, at least not that much, like I take enough to like sustain myself, but I'm not giving myself a big payday. Zach's not giving himself a big payday, but it's like, it's all centered around this podcast. And then the live shows are to, uh, give people like the unique experience and then, you know, make those people die hard fans. And so it's just like, yeah, it's all one big nucleus. Where does your musical background come into all of this? Not background. Where does your musical, I don't want to say hobby. Yeah, no, I, you know, it doesn't like re uh, rear its head too much, like in the podcast sense. Like I made, I made the intro music for it that we've been using since the beginning. Um, and really that's kind of like the only sense that my musical background plays into uh the podcast but sorry not not in terms of the podcast more in the terms of the pie chart of jared's time oh 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 that has definitely like i love it so much I, and it's such a passion of mine and i would love to you know support myself uh even though like the podcast is like my full-time thing. I would love to also have, you know, my music be successful or whatnot. But right now it is kind of just like a hobby, you know, it's like, I, I love making music and I love sharing the music with people because I know the feeling that I get when I listen to other people's songs and I connect with them or like, uh, or just enjoy listening to it, you know? And so as a hobby, it's, uh, I kind of just work on it in my free time. So now the office honestly has kind of helped me divide my time with the podcast where it's like now Monday through Friday, like I'm in the office, you know, working or doing something. The um, new studio at yeah, North Hollywood. Yeah. The new one. And so like I'm in there basically we'll say 10, like 10 to six or something, you know? And it's like, that's my time to focus on the podcast. And then I come home and I'm like, okay, I did all my work for the podcast today. Now I'm going to take the rest of the time. I'm going to take like an hour to chill and just kind of like recuperate and then go into spending the rest of the night, like working on music, you know? So like, that's what I was doing. Granted yesterday was Sunday, but I was still like doing work for the podcast i was like editing and whatnot but after all that was done then took an hour and then started hopping on to to music and like writing songs and making them and producing them because i've got a lot of ideas that i just want to get out because i think either people will really connect with them or just enjoy them even if they're not like the deepest songs you know and so, yeah, that's it's kind of like a hobby right now, but I still love it. Are you the editor of the podcast? Yep. And I think I always will be. Um, you do all the syncing? Do it. Yeah. Coloring. I mean, the syncing and stuff, honestly, Premiere does a great job of that. Like I, 
just kind of like I load up all of it and I hit like the little create a multicam source sequence, you know, and then puts it all together. There's like a little like minutia, like details that I have to do in there. But for the most part, I don't have any trouble with that. And, uh, but yeah, it's just like the, the editing tone has been super established. And then it also like for the last minute things, you know, like, uh, like last minute episodes, whatever, it's just so nice to like do that in house and not have to worry about like getting the footage to somebody or, um, you know, just like doing all the, the notes and stuff afterwards. Cause we, we tried that with one episode, like hiring an outside person and they did a great job. But then when I was going through and like fixing it, you know, like how I would have done it, I was like, I'm just re I'm spending all the time I would edit this anyway, doing all the notes. So I was like, let me just do it in house. And at this point it's down to such a science for me that before the first episode of dropouts took me 16 hours to edit or something like that. And now I've got it down to like four. You guys do pretty extensive research on your guests. Who is the hardest person to come up with your questions? Neil deGrasse Tyson? No, that was so easy. Really? I, yeah. Well, so with his episode, he um, he had a book that just came out. So Zach and I both read that uh, and we were able to get questions from there. But also, I just like, I love astronomy. Like that's always been like when I was a kid, I mowed lawns for an entire summer so I could save up and buy a telescope, you know, because I heard that you could see Orion's nebula uh, with just like a normal standard telescope. And I wanted to see it with my own eyes so bad that I worked for an entire summer to save up for that. So like, I've always been a huge astronomy fan. I've always been a huge Neil fan. And uh, I took meteorology because I thought I was going to learn about meteors. <laughs> Turns out it's about weather. <laughs> Sucks. Weather's boring. The as whole hell. class, I was so confused. I'm like, when are we getting to the space stuff? <laughs> like, I don't care about clouds, man. <laughs> it didn't make any sense to me. Dude, what's the humidity? God, get get me out of this. Yeah, and so I was just like, I was always a huge Neil fan, huge astronomy fan. And so like I Honestly, I want to do a part two of that episode because he went to go film Theo Vaughn's episode right after that. So he was on like a little bit of a time crunch. So we didn't get as much time as I'd like with him. But I think I had six pages of questions for him uh, just like about everything and anything, you know, uh, who is the hardest, though? Um, Ray Romano. Ray Romano was kind of tough because I obviously he's an icon you know he's like one of the biggest tv stars uh at uh, of his time and it was like you wanted to fangirl but also not at the same time and so uh it was it was a little bit difficult coming up with thought-provoking questions for his episode you had um, neil uh you had ned's declassified too no yeah we had them and they're fantastic as well. Like they're so personable. They have their own pot. The best is when a pot or a guest has their own podcast. Cause they cause know how to talk. They baby. know how to talk. And so like, they're super personable. They, uh, they know how to talk. And then it's like, while I didn't really grow up with that show, that was like one of the Nickelodeon shows that I missed. It was like, it was so easy to, I think it's on Netflix, you know? So it was like, I could watch a few episodes, get some, uh, get like an idea of what the show is about, how all their characters were, and then go and like listen to their podcast and see how they are now and like then talk about the transition from there, you know. Um, but yeah, I'd say like I'd say Ray was probably one of the toughest ones. Yeah, for sure. I saw him at dinner the other night. I was so close to saying, I love you on dropout. <laughs> I couldn't. I couldn't. You, you should have. And then he just what <laughs> yeah that's what i was like what's that because <laughs> it was like kind of long ago I yeah did you watch wrestlemania did i watch what wrestlemania no i've never oh i, I pegged you as a wrestling uh yeah me neither no <laughs> no, no, no no totally who who watches wrestling it was fucking sick who i i mean i uh I never watched it growing up, but a big hit with uh, my friend group growing up, like, you know, when you played like Xbox or something and it was all like split screen or whatever, we would play WWE on 
on the Xbox. And so I did grow up doing that. My guy was always the Miz. Really? Uh, <laughs> just because, like, I <laughs> don't know. Over the Undertaker and Kane and that's what every. That's whatever. I like the underdog, man, you know? And so I, I don't know anything about these people's stories. But I was like, this is just, like, a plain, like, looking dude. Dude like, in his underwear. Dude Give me in, him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everyone else, yeah, like, the Undertaker, like, Rey Mysterio. I was like, why are you being all flashy with this? I'm going to whoop your ass in some tidy whities oh, you know? That's so funny. Yeah. What else did you do growing up for fun? Because to get into the camera world and social media world, I feel like me and you both had pretty similar journeys because I went to school for it also. You know, I didn't really ever do anything in like the camera world. I'm kind of like I was kind of the black sheep of my friend group uh, and kind of like my school um, in the sense of like I didn't want to go on to become like a professor or a lawyer or a doctor. You know, I was one of the few that actually like wanted to do something kind of like in the artistic sense. But like growing up, it was a normal childhood. Like uh, I played like basketball, baseball, football. Um, during the like during winter uh there was like a like a park that had like a giant hill and so like we'd go sledding there um just like hanging out we kind of grew up not in like the suburbs of Cincinnati it was like still in the city but it was a little farther out so it kind of felt like the suburbs did you spend much time on the internet no like that no that's, YouTube no Instagram that, no Vine I the Vine uh I wasn't allowed to have uh social media until I turned 18. Um, and so Your I actually, rules? yeah. No. Yeah. And so my senior year of high school, I actually like sneakily made a Facebook account because uh, there was like a senior class group chat that was going on that would tell you like parties and events that were happening or whatever. So I made one then uh, to kind of like keep up with all that. But up until then, I wasn't allowed to have social media. Was that the Keebler's rules or Procter and Gamble's that rules? That was Procter and Gamble's oh. rules. I know. Keebler would have been like, down. oh, she, yeah, she would have been all over it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's like I didn't really grow up on YouTube. The only thing I really watched on YouTube growing up was uh, was like Rooster Teeth. Um, but other than that, like all the OG YouTubers and stuff, like never really kind of had an idea about all of that. Um, Instagram came super late. And then Vine I had, but I never posted anything on that. And also my mom wasn't savvy enough to know about Vine. Um, so like, obviously I was, I was big into that. I kind of had it without her knowing. But yeah, other than that, I wasn't really on the internet. You grew up with two moms, correct? Yeah. Did you ever have a male role model? Uh, so my mom is the the twelfth of thirteen children. And Twelve. Yeah, it's nuts. And uh, so like my my uncle, um, he is he's the thirteenth, and so th my mom and him are pretty close in age. And then he has three kids of his own who are all uh, the the oldest uh, were six weeks apart, like on the dot so i grew up with them and uh and her siblings so i kind of had like another extended like kind of close family so he was kind of like my male role model um and then those were like his his kids my cousins were like my siblings you know growing up but uh besides that you know i there was you know some bullying uh in school for like having two moms uh but my immediate friend group one of my other friends also had two moms which is kind of funny like small world but uh but so yeah it was like it wasn't they, they had been friends since like kindergarten i came in in like third grade so like they had kind of known each other for a little bit before i came in so having two me having two moms wasn't a new thing for them. And so I was pretty quickly accepted by that. Like that fact was pretty quickly accepted. And then when you had questions about, I don't know, like growing up and stuff, would you ask your uncle for that? No, I would. Uh, my mom and I are so like open with everything, you know, like uh, when I got a little bit older, like right before puberty, my mom had this like encyclopedia that she would bust out every once in a while if I had any questions and like be able to walk me through and it had like diagrams and stuff. So, uh, you know, it sounds weird to like go to your mom for that, but at the same time, that's all I knew. That's all I had really. And so 
I, you know, she, she was explaining, she's like, okay, when you get to a certain age, you're going to notice like your voice is going to change. And then like, there's like a picture of like testicles or whatever. She's like, these are going to, they're going to drop, you know, things are, you're going to get like hair down there, all that stuff. And I remember actually when I first started football in seventh grade, um, it was all the same locker room uh, as like the upper uh, classmen and stuff. And I remember one time there was like a senior that was like taking a shower and he walked out without like putting a towel on. And that was kind of my first experience of like a man's penis. <laughs> <laughs> and I went home that day and I, I asked her, I was just like, I was like, his was really hairy. And is that, way bigger. And way bigger. I was like, <laughs> is that going to happen? And she's like, okay, let's get the encyclopedia and then whatever. But yeah, we've always been super open and honest about that stuff. And when I was like 13 or 14, maybe 15 or something, whenever the, the Kate Upton like Sports Illustrated swimsuit like cover came out. Did they snag you a copy? Yeah, for my birthday. It was great. It was Moms. like we've always been super open about that. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I hated the locker room in high school. Dude, same. And like I, I was a chubbier kid. And same. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. 260? Yeah. No, I know you were. I was 230. <laughs> But it, yeah, it's just like it's uh, you gotta take you know, your shirt off. You gotta take your shirt off, and like when you're not confident in your body, and it's, it's just like yeah, I always felt I was the I was the kid that would <laughs> that would always change. So in seventh grade, we also had to take uh, like swim lessons. You know, even if you knew how to swim, you had to. You had to like, go in a pool in the middle of the day. Uh yeah, Ugh. yeah, it was disgusting. You know, and. Um, and so, like, to change into that, I was the kid that would, like, go into the corner of, like, the locker room uh, where you could, like, tie up a towel between two lockers in the corner and then change like that while other kids were just, like, dick to the wind. I don't <laughs> you know? know how they did that. The, the confidence on some of these kids, I wish I had that growing up. They had to grow up with brothers or something. Something. Yeah, like, some sort of siblings or just, you know, maybe they grew up in a nudist colony or Probably something. Probably their parents are just swinging <laughs> Yeah. They had to. Have. Yeah, it was, it was so bizarre, but... I, yeah, I was always so self-conscious. Where do you see dropouts going in the future? I see us hopefully, you know, fingers crossed, just keep getting bigger and bigger. Like, obviously, we would love to be number one on uh, at least the comedy charts. You do you know, know what, what was the highest you ever peaked? I think right now we're at nine or ten. That's crazy, Jared. Yeah, I know. That's really crazy. It's, it's stupid. The dude. entire planet, you're nine. <laughs> yeah. Who's above you? Um, people like Caller Daddy, Theo Vaughn, Joe Rogan. Well, that well, he, he's not comedy. He's not comedy. But uh, on on the overall charts, I think we're at like thirty nine or thirty eight or something like that. Of all podcasts. Of all podcasts. Um, but comedy, you know. Uh, you guys are above everyone else in your circle. Yeah. So actually, I think I think uh, pretty unfiltered, like their new one. Um, I think they're above us now, which makes sense. I mean, Zane, Heath, Remy, Ashley, you know, uh, it, it just like it just makes sense. And so uh, or Alicia, not Ashley. Um, Ashley is my favorite. one. <laughs> and so, yeah, I think they're above us. But for the most part, yeah above everybody else which is it's so it's dumb it's stupid it doesn't do you, feel real do you guys keep getting guests going forward with tara and zach oh yeah yeah yeah, 100 percent. so like we we just had tana on um we are bringing uh quinlan blackwell back next week well we already filmed but it'll come out next week and then from there it's just we want to get like bigger and better guests so when we go to new york um, uh, Sal from Impractical Jokers has already said that he's down to do it. And we also had Chrissy D on, uh, like last year when we went to New York and then, um, even this is huge for me cause I'm a big flagrant fan, but Andrew Schultz said he's down to come on. And so we're going to try to get him when we go to New York, which is just huge, you know, like that flagrant in itself was like a big North star for a while and still is, you know, just the way, um, that they run their business and run their show. So that's kind of surreal for me. I can't imagine many people turning you guys down with the numbers you're getting now. 
you yeah you'd be surprised you know like there's some people that just like uh some of the humor doesn't line up with like their public image you know and the thing is is like our whole mantra of dropouts is like we just want it to sound like friends hanging out you know and uh sometimes you say like crass jokes with your friends when you think that like nobody's listening or whatever and yeah it's just like Zach always likes to say it's all about intent. Like, obviously, you know, we joke about like, Tara, where'd you wake up this morning? And it's like, obviously, we don't think Tara's like a bop or a slut or whatever you want to call her. You know, it's just like a funny joke amongst friends. And some people that doesn't line up with how they want their public image being seen. As the editor of Dropouts, do you have a gauge of what you can let slide through and what you have to cut out? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so, like, the thing, one of the cons about being an editor uh, or being the editor for Dropouts, um, and also one of the pros is just, like, I, while we're filming, I'm constantly thinking about the 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 edit and how it's going to flow and like if i need to if you know zach or tara you know says something that we need cut out i'm like okay where's the stop point where i'm gonna start the cut and then where's the end point you know and uh but yeah i've definitely built up a gauge uh of what's what's allowed what's passable and even some stuff that like zach thinks is fine i'm just like i'll cut it anyway because i'm just gonna save us from the nightmare of, of letting this fly so going forward some insane guests hopefully yeah you'll definitely get sal he loves podcasting he loves podcasting and then he's you know he's seen clips of the podcast and he loves it we you know like i said we had chrissy d on who's like one of his podcast partners and so um yeah, hopefully, hopefully he does it. Andrew said he's seen some of the clips. And Who else he, is a dream guest of yours? Oh, I mean like Theo. Um, you can't I, get him? I'm sure we could. I think it's just like a scheduling thing because I think he's based in Nashville now. Oh, I thought he was still in L.A. I think he has like a studio here still. Um, but like honestly, so many comedians uh, are on our list because uh, Zach and I, or even Tara now, it, like we're all just huge fans of stand-up comedy and so uh so like theo we'd love to get i would love to get tom and or uh christina on because like i've been a fan of their podcast for so long um and then i love uh, when you guys had bobby on dude bobby was such a dream so funny he's so funny and just like he i mean he commands every room that he walks into you know like he just has that kind of personality and uh like just the fact that like he like making me take off my shirt and like hug each other for two minutes or something in complete silence like it's hilarious so we got to do a follow-up episode with him i would love to get santino on um because bad friends is another like podcast that we're huge on so um even in the the flagrant realm like akash would be great to have on um uh like uh, Trevor Wallace and uh, Michael, what's his name? Um, the, the the other uh, host on Stiff Socks. Um, I can't, he has a funny name. I can't remember what, what it is, but l would love to get him on. So, yeah, there's just a lot. And then even if we can go up into like A-list, B-list, you know, celebrities, actors, people like that. Um yeah, it would just be like if we could get like Ryan Reynolds or uh, Zach is I don't know if this is public knowledge, but um, but he's doing some work with Rob McElhenney's uh, company, uh, one of them. And so we actually just ran into him at a Lakers game the other day. You ran into Rob? Yeah. That's and cool. so like would love to get him on any of like the It's Always Sunny cast. There's so many people. Damn yeah oh i'm so excited guys go subscribe to dropouts if you're not yet link down below jared thanks so much for coming thank you for having me this is fun this is great thanks for watching give this video a like let us know who else you want to see on thanks uh lightweights oh michael blaustein that's his name yes <laughs> <laughs> that was great thank you so much of course thank I just you just have thumbnails of your face